On the morning of February 11th, 1934, a thick blanket of fog covered the Northeast from Maine to Virginia. Visibility was measured in inches. Everything was grounded. But at a small rural airport in upstate New York, 25-year-old Ed Link prepared his Cessna for takeoff. Deeply in debt and struggling to keep his fledgling flight school alive, Link knew that everything he had depended on this flight. What Link would accomplish that day in the skies above New York would propel him into a life of invention and discovery. Ed Link was an original. There was not anyone like him around before or since. Ed Link was a true American genius. He dreamed the big dreams and then he made them happen. Your first impression would be that he was an ordinary man, but he was a pretty incredible genius. He uh, was a modest man, but able to make connections in his mind that most of us just can't make. He was a remarkable person. Aviator, inventor, industrialist, deep sea diver, Ed Link did it all. A high school dropout at 17, he would make himself a millionaire before he was 40. It's hard to explain how important Ed Link was to the world of inventions and the world of science. He was, simply speaking, probably the most prolific inventor we had of the 20th century. He advanced in leaps and bounds how we first explored the sky and then how we explored the sea. Because of Ed Link, we were able to do things that we couldn't do before. The human family no longer thinks of the ocean as it used to before Ed Link. His father forced Ed to come to work at the piano factory. I started out at the bottom, he remembered. It wasn't what I had planned for a career, but it's curious how things work out. Ed's years at the piano factory would help mold his future. The craftsmen who worked in the factory helped sharpen Ed's innate creative abilities. He quickly became a master at building and tuning the massive theater organs with their miles of pipes and wires. Ed displayed a remarkable ability for forging the connection between his head and his hands. When he was just 19 years old, he received his first patent for a suction device he created to lift dust out of piano rolls. It was a simple little thing, Ed told a writer years later, designed to make my job easier. Ed had become the factory's most versatile employee, and his father was pleased. They thought I was going to make a nice organ builder, Ed remembered, but I had other plans. At that time, people were learning to fly by the seat of their pants, so to speak, and there was no way for them to, to really understand the workings of a plane before they got in the air. And Consequently, many people died, were killed in plane crashes, and so Ed thought about this a lot, and he thought there's no, there's no real reason why this has to be. There has to be a way to make a good workable trainer that would teach people something about planes, at least before they ever got off the ground. Ed envisioned a tool that could simulate the feel and response of an airplane in flight. In a dark corner of the organ factory, Ed went to work. Link wanted motion for his flight trainer. 
Well, how do you create motion? In the link organ and the link piano, you create motion using a vacuum system. So he developed a vacuum system that would create the motion for the trainers. For more than a year, Ed worked on perfecting his flight trainer using his brother Theron and others as test subjects. Finally, on April 14, 1929, Ed received a patent for his pilot maker. Link moved quickly and opened a flight school in the basement of the piano factory using his trainer as the primary teacher. He guaranteed to teach anyone to fly for just $85. Within two months, 100 people had signed up. Link began building additional trainers with the intention to sell them to other flight schools across the country. But in October, the economy collapsed. Millions were out of work. Few people had money for flying lessons. Link concentrated on marketing his trainer, but with little success. Except for park owners, who used it as an amusement ride. Then in December 1930, the piano factory folded, leaving Link's flight school without a home. Ed moved the flight school to a small airfield on the outskirts of Binghamton. Barnstorming when he had to, giving lessons when he could, Link, like the rest of the country, struggled to survive. But as the depression deepened, the school teetered on failure. By 1931, Two years had passed since Ed had invented his pilot maker. He had focused almost entirely on flying and perfecting his trainer. But he also found time to fall in love. Marion Clayton was a spirited and energetic reporter for the Binghamton Press. Ed had met her the year before on a blind date, and she had written a story about him and his air-minded dog. Ed Link was basically a shy guy, but I think when it came to Marion, he just couldn't resist her. She was beautiful. She was a charming young lady, and he just knew that she was the one for him. June 1940, all of Europe is engulfed in war. The German Luftwaffe had begun terror bombing London. And in the skies over England, a tremendous battle raged for control of the air. The Battle of Britain would be the turning point of the air war in Europe. Vastly outnumbered, the Royal Air Force now relied heavily on Link's blue box to train their crews in record time. Clearly, the ability to train large numbers of pilots quickly was critical to winning the war. Air Marshal Robert Leckie, he was the head of the Royal Canadian Air Force. He said, the Battle of Britain is being won on the training fields where there are Link trainers. By the end of the war, Link was exhausted. For 16 years, he had worked endlessly to build his company. He began spending time in the Canadian wilderness, hunting and fishing with Marion and his two young boys, William and Clayton. The industry he created had taught thousands of men and women to fly and helped win a world war. But Ed Link was a restless man and would soon seek a new frontier. He would find it in the deep waters of the world's oceans where he would achieve his greatest triumphs. Ed had the kind of mind that was always seeing potential where nothing existed yet. He saw things that we're not doing yet that we're going to have to do under the oceans. And, and he realized that they're going to have to have the equipment and the um, way to survive the same as, in fact, he thought it was more important to, um, to do underwater research than it was even to go to space. So he began to invent equipment that could keep you down underwater longer periods of time. In 1961, in cooperation with the National Geographic Society, Ed began work on a program he called Man in Sea. My ultimate aim is to put divers on the floor of the ocean, Ed wrote, and to live and work there at depths up to a thousand feet for days, weeks, even months. If we can do this, he added, we will have available the resources of an area the size of the continent of Africa. And Link had created a device 
to allow man to do just that. Ed was a guy with his eyes on the horizon all the time. He knew the interior of the sea, and he knew the dangers of decompression. And what he wanted to do was to minimize that risk, not only just for, for himself, but for all those humans who were actually going to go deep and spend time working in the sea. So that was the origin of the submersible decompression chamber, a kind of underwater elevator that allowed people to climb on board on a ship, go down to the depth where they'd be working, let's say two, three, four hundred feet, do the work, and come back and then be controlled in the decompression. On August 28, 1962, Ed tested his submersible decompression chamber off the coast of France. For eight hours at 60 feet below the surface, Ed himself acted as guinea pig. And that's what was so wonderful about the guy. This was not an engineer who built things in a laboratory and then let other people use them. He was always the first guy to test them. As he said to me, you know, uh, if you want to build these things and if you're going to design them and build them, you have to have uh, the integrity to go and test them. And I like that about him. The next day, Robert Stendouit, a world-renowned test diver, spent 26 hours at 200 feet below sea level. It was, up to that time, the longest, deepest dive ever accomplished. For the next six months, Ed and his team carried out one groundbreaking experiment after another at depths never before imagined. On April 10, 1964, Sea Diver was anchored in the Mediterranean, preparing for its deepest dive to date. The small factory that Ed had started 35 years before had grown into a billion dollar industry and was now the primary simulation resource for training the men who would walk on the moon. But the aviator had moved on to a new frontier and was ready to unveil his latest creation. The deep diver was the very first uh, working lockout submarine. This was a real stroke of genius, where he, he looked at what he had learned from the deep dive uh, with the underwater station, decided that mobility was what he really wanted, and, uh, and built this small submarine, uh, the first of its kind in the world that would put divers um, anywhere on the continental shelf. Now keep in mind the continental shelf is an area the size of Africa. It's 11.5 million square miles. So we would make a dive let's say to 400, 500 feet, park the submarine on the bottom, and the divers in the back uh, compartment, in the stern compartment, would pressurize and make a lockout dive. In other words, the hatch would fall open once the pressure inside was equal to the water pressure. The hatch would fall open, and they would actually, we call it locking out, going out into the, uh, into the ocean, do their work, come back in, close the hatch, and then come back to the surface. Ed had met and become friends with Dr. Seward Johnson, executive and heir to the Johnson & Johnson empire. Seward shared Ed's love for the sea and had begun work on developing an institute to promote research of the world's oceans. And Ed had already started to build what Marion described as a submarine of radically different design. He wanted to create a vehicle that would give researchers a view of the sea only dreamed of by writers of science fiction. But Ed was a man who took dreams and made them real. On January 29, 1971, at the newly created Harbor Branch Oceanographic Institute in Florida, Ed and Seward launched the Johnson Sea Link. Marion described it as the first manned, diver-carrying small submersible to be made available to scientific institutions strictly for marine research. Nicknamed the Bubble Sub, the Sea Link was equipped with a four-inch thick acrylic sphere providing, as Marion called it, a window to the sea. In the rear of the sub was a chamber for carrying divers to depths below 1,500 feet. Forty years before, Edwin Link had changed the world of aviation with his little blue box made of piano parts. Now he had opened the seas for man to explore like never before. He was a high school dropout who had survived the Depression and a world war. Ed felt his life had been touched by magic. 
Everything I have, he told a friend, I owe to my family and to God. In 1953, he and Marion decided to start the Link Foundation. Ed and Marion, when they set up the Link Foundation, didn't set it up just to give money to people who have 100% grade levels in school. Uh, Ed certainly knew that he'd had problems in school and he, he understood the, the problems that other students might have had. What they set it up to do was to give money to those students who showed an initiative and an energy level that would delve into the science of first the exploration of our skies and secondly the exploration of our seas. He wanted to make sure that those students had the opportunity to develop their own genius. And in looking at it in retrospect, probably the Link Foundation is his true and long-lasting legacy. On May 30th, 1981, with his wife of 50 years by his side, Ed Link received his fifth honorary degree from the State University at Binghamton. Though battling heart disease and cancer, Link still dreamed of heading out for more adventures with his bride and first mate. There's this little um, anniversary card that he made for her, and he had put in it two tickets to somewhere. So they were still going to make a, a final trip. She never knew where, you know, because it didn't say, but uh, that was just shortly before he died. On September 7, 1981, Edwin Link died quietly in his sleep at his home in Binghamton. He was 77 years old. He was laid to rest in a simple grave near his son. When I think of Ed, I think of that, that wonderful saying, and that is, to be a real explorer is not just to discover new lands, but is to see with new eyes. And uh, I think that's one of the great legacies of Ed Link. He taught a number of us to kind of look at things with new eyes. After his death, a friend wrote, Ed Link was a man who saw the sky reflected in water and altered our perception of both. He was a man who touched a spark in the minds of others, a spark that caused a nation to be proud and men to reach beyond themselves to the stars and into the unknown depths of the sea.